Um, and what do you think about... Boy, I don't even know. I had a question and I forgot. <laughs> um, was there... Like, this is maybe me being a film major, but was there a lot of, like, distrust amongst, like, Russian or citizens or anything? Like, maybe people who lived in this country? Yeah, precisely. Because I know for the longest time, Russians were the bad guys. And as a matter of fact, in video games, they still are because it's kind of almost too sensitive in many cases to make, like, Middle Easterners, like, the bad guys. Yeah. Still, so... Well, with Middle Easterners, there are so many of them. And who are you going to oh, call sure. the bad guys? Oh, absolutely. And you that's know, one of the problems you know. we've seen in even domestically, where right. people are, like, throwing rocks at... You know, they're like, oh, you're a Muslim. And it's like, well, first off, that's right. that's not a great way to start. But, like, no, this person is a, is a Sikh, and this person is, like, Indian, and this right. person's Buddhist. And if you're, you know, dumb enough and angry enough, you don't really care about those differences. But right. Yeah, it's it's a uh, um, it's just easier to have like to say the Russians. I mean, yeah. there's still I mean there's still a lot of uh, problems. I mean, we're, there's still a lot of concerns, and and I think you know the biggest concern that we all have is that that some crazy person doesn't get a hold of the bomb. Now, North Korea, they're they're certifiable, so uh, you never know what Kim Jong Un is going to do over there. Uh, look at his hair. Oh, God. That tells you right off the bat that he's not playing with a full deck. But um, you just hope that, that uh, whoever has the bomb is uh, uh, only going to use it as a defensive thing, as something to, to keep other people from using the bomb. Yeah, I mean, the, the policy of deterrence or right. something right. thereof. Well. And that's why there's concerns, I think, among many of us about the upcoming election. Mm -hmm. Who's going to have their finger on the button? Sure. And what are they going to say to other people with their fingers on, on the, the button? button? Right. I dare you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, unfortunately, that sounds about right. imaginable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Oops. Missing entry ticket. Yeah, yeah they added another... Um, Oh. Yeah, another piece of paper to go through here. Okay, so that's good. Cool. Oh, oh, this person maybe looks different. So. Yeah, a person who looks different than that person. Cool, we're actually, we finished talking it. Oh, it, it is matching apparently, so I guess. That matches? Allegedly. Well, okay. I mean, I guess it is my life on the line if I screw up, but what else can you do? Oh, wait, I should check the issuing import Sukunado. Okay, good. So, yeah. It's just a game. <laughs> Oh, yeah, okay, so that's obviously. It is an old picture. <laughs> well. This is an old denied stamp. GTFO. So did you ever do those, like, I mean, you must have done those duck and cover drills when you were a kid, right? Where you, like, get under the desk and... Yeah, yeah. And that's supposed to help you out? Right. Somehow? Somehow it was supposed to give you the additional protection. Um, that's kind of interesting. I mean, we all saw the pictures of what an H-bomb or an A-bomb looked like going off, and... I don't know why it never occurred to us if a bomb went off anywhere near us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, nothing we were going to do was going to help at all. But, I mean, I guess there would be a, like where we lived in New Jersey, for instance. We were probably 20, 25 miles from New York City. If New York City was bombed, 
I, I don't think there'd be very much left of us anyway, but uh, yeah. if we were a little further away, then you'd have the fallout, and you know, supposedly you'd, you didn't want all that radioactivity, so uh, you had to stay covered up and make sure that the radioactivity didn't uh, reach your body. But uh, Sure. You know, you, you realize, too, that when you say, you know, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have Google, we didn't have any of that stuff, so if the government told you something, right, you believed it. I mean, there was really no way to verify a lot of that stuff. Yeah. And, um, and of course, when you're younger, too, you don't have the, the chops to, uh, uh, to challenge. You're not going to challenge your teachers, you know, when you're 9, 10 years old, something right. like that. Oh, absolutely. So... Um, you did what they told you to do. Yeah, and there's kind of like a you know missing the grand scheme. Like even when I was when I was in school, we would do fire drills. Right. And it's like I would, I just remember I'd walk in and be like, where would the fire be? Right. Like we've got these metal overhangs. The halls are outside. Everything is cement. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, but we did it anyway. Right. Yeah, oh, sure. Of course, they told us to. I mean, I'm not complaining. Fire drills were a nice break. But well, that's what I always thought, too, when we did those things. You know, I got you out of the classroom. It was a big change of pace and kind of made the day a little bit more interesting than sitting there and having to learn something. Uh, <laughs> what do I know? Yeah. Page two. Oh, no, I'm trying to read the bulletin. There we go. Okay, well, great. I'm completely <laughs> flummoxed with this game right at the right at the correct time. I don't really even see this as a game. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, that brings me to my next question, which is, what do you think of this of this experience? I just find it boring. That's fair. I'm sorry. That's just no. And that's the thing. I well, I guess there's two ways to approach this, and like I've implied, I think a lot of people impro- approach this just because it's a curiosity. Like the mm-hmm. game is. I think it's less than five bucks. Right. So it's kind of like you just kind of enjoy what may have been someone's school thesis project. Right. (laughs) And you're like, oh, this is funny. Let's make some videos about it. The other way, and one of my friends has said he really relates, like he empathizes with the situation and like between each level, you see how your family is doing. They'll be hungry or they'll be cold. Oh, my gosh. And so like it gets really depressing and I guess you could let it depress you so there there there's probably a so story in here somewhere why then is it a game why is you know i mean to me something that's a game that's enjoyable is something that is fun and light and doesn't have all kinds of things to make me upset and sad yeah well i mean maybe people want to see where it goes like maybe it has a happy ending eventually i no i i understand and i'm not saying that my feelings should should, are better than anybody else's feelings. That they're just my feelings. I'm just not crazy about this kind of. I'm not crazy about most games. Period. But uh, this one I don't find very interesting at all. Yeah, and I don't blame you. Like I was saying, people people requested you experience this game kind of for that reason. They wanted to get your opinion. Well, I mean, you know, younger, older. People are going to feel differently about things. I mean, I can understand how some people would like this. I just don't. I don't have the patience to sit around. I mean, I don't watch, you know, dramas on television. I don't watch even sitcoms on television, except rarely, because I just don't have the patience for it. I see. So, um, oh, we're up 15 bucks. Yeah, except our son is cold, sick, and hungry. So. Uh, 
So, I mean, if I could ask, if I dare to ask, because I think I know more or less what the answer is going to be, like, what would it take for a game to capture your attention? Wow. I don't know. I, 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 uh... I'm, you know, I've never been into sports. I, I'm still not into sports. I, I barely know the names of the teams and whatever else. Sure. I, I don't really enjoy, I don't know, pitting one side against the other, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, I say that in, when I teach yoga a lot. I'm like, it's not a competitive sport. Or, Otherwise, right. I wouldn't be doing it. Right. And, and I just don't, um, I don't know. I don't know what would make me want to really stay with it. I'm just, it's just, I have to say, it's really just kind of not my thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but you, I mean, you've, you've at least had pleasant observations during, say, Outlast. Right. Because there are nuggets that can catch your attention there are things you can appreciate but when you have like you kind of hit your diminishing returns with a game like this which is very it's kind of, it's kind of clinical yes I that's mean, that's a, that's a great that's way of word. putting it it's clinical you, you you're analyzing every step of the way you're analyzing all these different things and making a decision yeah well like look now i have to compare his entry permit lists a passport number which i have to compare with his passport so it's like we're just adding extra steps. steps. Right. I've, I get the feeling like if you're OCD, this game is your jam. <laughs> but I am not. So, um, anyway. One of the things when we did our test run of this game, we talked about uh, television mm -hmm. back in the day. Because mm -hmm. you, you were... You probably had like one of the first sets of TVs right. that was available. Right. How was that? Well, uh, let's see. I was probably about five years old, so I'm guessing like it would be 48 or 49, 1948 or 1949. Gotcha. Um, when we got our first television. And it was a big box with a very small screen. The screen was probably... 12 inches by 12 inches. That's what she said. <laughs> yeah, you wish. Um, <laughs> and, um, you, you know, we lived right outside of New York City, and so you had to have an antenna that could hit the, uh, that could be pointed to um, the, uh, well, at the time it was the Empire State Building, which had the, oh, television, wow. had the television antennas on top. How cool. And we only had... We only had seven stations. Two, four, five, seven, nine, eleven, and thirteen. Two was CBS, four was NBC, five was local, was WNEW in New York, um, seven was WABC, nine was WOR out of New Jersey, eleven was what was it, WPIX, and thirteen was the PBS station, or whatever made it for, it wasn't called PBS back right, then. Right, right. But uh, that's what it was. And that's all we had. And, uh, and the stations didn't stay on the air 24 hours a day. Uh, usually at the end of the last show at night, whenever it was, 10 or 11 or 12, they would play the Star Spangled Banner. Wow. And then they'd put up a test pattern. Huh. And the test pattern would stay up all night until they started broadcasting again in the morning, whatever time that was, 6 or 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> we had some 15-minute television shows. Wow. Well, we, and it's funny, we have that again, but it's like the Adult Swim, like, right. test kind of, right. test comedy. Yeah. But I remember Captain Video and his Video Rangers. What is that? <laughs> it was like a, uh, I think very, very, um, uh, very basic Star Wars or something like that. You know, hmm. very, like, um. <laughs> very unhip, very uncool by today's standards, but it was Captain Video and his Video Rangers. Um, yeah, the, the there wasn't a whole lot on television when I was growing up. 
And then, uh, and it was, of course, it was in black and white. We didn't get color. I would say color came in early 60s, I'm guessing. Wow. Um, and it was NBC, it was RCA that developed it. And I remember you'd see the, um, there'd be a, a logo with a peacock with all the different colors. Yeah. And the following show is in living color, brought to you on NBC. And, wow, we couldn't believe it. We were watching color television. Huh. Of course, you had to buy a color television right. to see it, but uh, by that point, we had the little black and white one for <laughs> 10 years or so with the 12-inch screen. Oh, yes, and with the 12-inch screen, we also we purchased a, um, a magnifier, which was probably 24 inches by 24 inches, and it was on a stand, a tripod, and it was... Um, it, it, you put it in front of the television mm -hmm. screen, and it magnified the television. Wow. Screen. Of course, it distorted the picture, as you sure, might imagine. Sure. But back then, but at least yeah. you could get a bigger picture wow. than this little, you know, huh. whatever it was. That's little screen. very cool. Um, I remember one day I had my friends over. It was one afternoon. Somebody hit the base by mistake, knocked it over, and broke. It, and the magnifier was full of like a soapy water or something like Whoa, that. Whoa, interesting! And it went all over the carpet. And else. <laughs> no, we never had a we never had one after that. <laughs> Another That's magnifier funny. after that. You know, those were the very early days of television. Hmm. Yep. And speaking of color, I mean, last time we went through this, you were telling me about one of your favorite shows back in the day. Yeah. Which one was that? That was Laugh-In. Laugh-In. What year, though? That This was certainly past Cold War Yeah, I'm era. thinking, I'm thinking Laugh-In probably started, I think, about 69. Yeah, I don't, th I don't, I think that was about the year, and it lasted for a number of years. And it was just the best show. It was, it was weekly. It was an hour long. It had great improv kind of comedians on it. Uh, it was uh, Dan Rowan and Dick Martin were two stand-up comics who always did an act together in Vegas, and they were the, the stars of the show. But there were so many other uh, people, and they were all characters. And some of them, you know, we see today. I mean, we know that Lily Tomlin, Li Lily Tomlin um, started actually before Laughing, but she was very popular in Laughing. She played Ernestine, the, the mm. telephone operator. Hello, Mr. Vito. This is Mrs. So and so okay. from the telephone company, and she always snorted like that, and that was her her big thing. And then she would she played uh, Edith Ann, which was the little girl, and they had a, a they they built a huge rocking chair, so she could mm. sit in it, and she would look like she was small, like a little girl oh, in this rocking wow. chair. At forced perspective, she was Edith yeah Edith Ann, and I I like to do things, and, and wow. that was. That was another character of her. She, she had a bunch of really terrific... They all did. Everybody, Joanne Worley, uh, they, they all had great, great characters. Artie Johnson did a, a German. <laughs> he would come up, he'd have a helmet on, and he'd come up through the bushes, and he'd oh my spread gosh. the bushes and say, <laughs> say things. And it was just, he was hysterical. And oh, I have to take a deep breath here. <clears throat> I have to... Compose myself. <sighs> my crush, my big crush, Goldie Hawn. <laughs> I mean, we all know Goldie Hawn today. Sure. But back then, she was this, this giggling airhead. Is the character she played, and she always giggled and she always got things wrong, and <laughs> and she was so adorable. You just wanted to hold her. <laughs> and she was something else. Yes. My first really big television crush, you know. Wow. Really loved it. Lo loved her. And <laughs> I loved all the characters. They were just, it was a great show. And and, and you just wish there'd be a show like that today. I mean, if, if they had right. en uh, enough people who were talented enough to be able to pull it off. They had a cast of about a dozen I people. Know. And, I mean, one it, the show was so popular. When Richard Nixon was president, one of the things they, they used to do, one of their bits was, sock it to me, sock it to me, baby, sock it to me. That was the, a thing. And they, they had all of these cameo appearances. People would come on. Well, Richard Nixon came on. Wow. And he did, sock it to me. 
<laughs> he couldn't get sock it to me, baby. Wow. You know, it was sock it to me, and everybody laughed because it was so funny. <laughs> and those were the kind of characters they had on. It was just, it was just a real fun show. Hmm. That's so cool. I miss it. Yeah, they don't really make them like that anymore. Well, think about the great uh, 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 comedy shows, the, the Carol Burnett show. Yeah. I mean, my gosh, Tim Conway, uh, um, Harvey Corman, I mean, Lyle Wagner, my goodness, Vicki Lawrence. What a show. I mean, every week the skits were just so funny. And, um, you know, miss that kind of stuff today. And I, I, I'm afraid to say it, but I, I don't see a lot of people coming up in the ranks that have the talent that those people had. Yeah. So... So we always have YouTube, though. Yeah. Luckily. I mean, I, I, I would just, anybody who's watching this and listening to this, go to YouTube, plug in Laugh In, and just watch some of it. It is so silly, and it is so funny, and it's a little dated by today's standards, but it's still really a funny show. Yeah. And now you had talked about, you mentioned Lily Tomlin. Yes. Was that the person you had that story about who you met, or was that someone else? someone else oh okay well good you can tell that story anyway it was when you interviewed someone who you had met years and years ago like before you went to Vietnam and I'm drawing a blank here oh you were like oh you're so and so and you we were with so and so and she was dressed like oh that was Phyllis Diller oh okay oh, oh, the Phyllis Diller <laughs> story okay if anybody remembers Phyllis Diller she was a very very funny comedian and always made herself up to look ugly and stupid and silly dresses and silly hairstyles and everything else. And to a big um, uh, highliner in in, uh, in Vegas. I mean, she uh, she played Vegas a lot. Well, I had friends who was turned out to be her musical director. And when I was living in Vegas for a while, they invited me to go see her show. So we went and saw her show her, her stand-up act at whatever hotel it was, casino it was. And then we went back to the dressing room afterwards. Well, the dressing room there was like like a house. I mean, it was like a, you had a living room. There was even a, a kitchen. There was a bedroom for the star to sleep in and whatever else. Pretty cushy. Yeah, very, very nice. And uh, walked in, and there was a bunch of people there, and one of them was Phyllis McGuire. She was of the McGuire sisters. They were singing, singing sister, a singing trio uh, back in the 50s and 60s. And uh, she was a little old at the time, but then she had this young stud on her arm, like a, a gigolo. Oh, I'm jealous and, of him. Um, and she was wearing, um, uh, she was this dress, and on, on the bottom of it, which was around about her knees, it had this fur uh, wrapped around the bottom hem. So it, it, it and it, it turns out that. Um, Figure skaters back then in the early days would dress like that with, uh, I see. with, with the fur along the bottom. I don't know why, sure, but that was I don't a, know, a like thing. a weird North a weird Pole thing. kind yeah, of North Santa thing. thing. Yeah. And anyway, so we were there and you know they spent the evening a couple of hours there and that was that. Years go by and I'm anchoring the news and Phyllis Diller's a guest on our newscast because she was appearing at the Kravis Center. Okay, so this was like, what, the 90s? This then? is probably, yeah, this is, um, oh, I'd say, I would say, let's say 95. So it's probably 25 years after the situation in Phyllis Diller's dressing room. Mm hmm. Okay? Uh, no, 20 years. 20 years, because it was probably 73, 74, 75, somewhere in there that um, I was in Vegas, and then 20 years later I'm doing the news. So we did the interview, and then after the show, after the newscast, I'm walking Phyllis to the door. And, you know, we're chatting. She was a sweetheart, and I said to her, um, gee, I don't know if you remember, but we've met before. I doubt that you remember, because we um, met in your dressing room. I was there with Marty and Audrey Heim, yeah, my, my musical director, yeah, blah, blah. And, um, and we came in after the show to, uh, you know, to talk with you afterwards. And she went, oh, yeah, that's the night that uh, uh, Dorothy McGuire was there, and she looked like Sonia Henney. <laughs> Sonia Henney 
was a figure skater. Oh my goodness! Back in the '30s, and and did a lot of movies that were figure skater movies. She remembered twenty years later that that night, Phyllis, she, Phyllis or Dorothy McGuire looked like Sonia Henning. She was dressed like that. Wow! She remembered, and I was thinking, you know, it, it probably comes from being a stand-up comic. Hmm. Think about how you have to train yourself to learn your routines, to remember everything, all your observations and things like that. And she was the best. Impressed the hell out of me. Wow. And a lovely lady, too, I must say. <laughs> Not an ounce of an ego, just a sweetheart and a very, very funny woman. She used to always talk about her husband, Fang. Fang? Fang. <laughs> and it was her made-up husband's name, uh, Fang, and all the terrible things that Fang did. So. <laughs> Let's yeah, you could look her up too. I'm sure she's on YouTube. I'm sure you can yeah. find some YouTube with Phyllis Diller. Oops. So, yeah, and it was some fun times. Fun times. Nice. Well, cool. Um, if my timer is correct, we've been going at this for about 50 minutes now. So I wow. think. Yeah, I think we got two episodes. That's probably plenty. I okay. Think I will wrap right. up the intermission here. This is Father and Fun playing Papers, Please. I'm Espresso Steampunk. And I'm Shecky. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.